Right. Welcome to Q&A in the House, streaming live on Facebook from Parliament House in Canberra. I'm Sabra Lane. Here to answer your questions today is the Energy and Environment Minister, Josh Frydenberg. Thank you very much, Josh, for joining us today. Nice to be with you, Sabra. And a warning, the division bells may ring here at Parliament, and if so, Josh is going to have to run them off. So we'll get kicking with your questions. Now, we get to your portfolio soon, but the issue of the day has been an issue that people have actually been writing in about. Susan Creasy on Facebook, and Susan, sorry if I've got your surname wrong, says it's all part of their desperate attack on Bill Shorten. The raid was totally unnecessary and done for the media and shock jocks. And Meg Joyce... Again, sorry if I've got your surname wrong, says they're trying, you're trying to create a diversion so that nobody looks at Barnaby who's about to get booted out. Is this a political stunt? No, it's not, uh, Sabra. Uh, obviously, the Registered Organisations Commission is independent of government, just as the federal police are. And I think it's completely wrong for anyone, whether they're in the parliament or outside the parliament, to make an allegation that these are arms of government. They're not. Uh, they're independent organisations that look into and investigate uh, issues of concern. Now, it's up to Bill Shorten to answer the question about the appropriateness uh, of those uh, particular donations by the AWU, one to get up and the other uh, to his campaign and to provide the documentation. So we await for him to do that. But the allegations that these are acting on the behest of government are completely wrong. All right, let's, there's another hot button issue. Ron Frey in Hobart asks, over the past several months, the decision to put the same-sex marriage to a public vote has revealed divisions in families, friendships, workplace, communities, and even churches. Hmm. How do we pick up the pieces once this concludes, regardless of which vote receives the most support? And what happens if the vote is very close? Well, neither of you or I actually know how this vote will play out, but what has been pleasing is the high level of turnout, which we're told is above 70%, uh, better than the Brexit uh, vote, and indeed better than similar referendums or the equivalent thereof that have been held in other countries. So uh, we're all awaiting the result. Personally, I voted yes, mm -hmm. uh, and I would like um, to see uh, a majority vote there. I think that there is always going to be differences of opinion on this issue uh, among the public, but by and large, people have uh, been respectful in this debate. There are always examples where that is not the case, but by and large, people have been. And I think that once the vote is in, uh, people uh, will respect the outcome. And if it's a yes vote, then the parliament will act accordingly. What about Ron's point? Do you think that there'll be... How do you pick up the pieces? Because in, in some places, it has been a little bit divisive. Yeah, well, as you would expect, there are differing views and people come to, to the table on this issue uh, with views based on different reasons, their personal experience, uh, might be religious reasons or other. So I think uh, that once the vote uh, is in, once the result is announced, uh, that, uh, that people will be able to move on. Uh, and hopefully it's a yes vote, which leads to same-sex marriage in Australia. And all those who have advocated for that will be very relieved. Okay, if you're watching us from home or in the office, Welcome, um, this is Q&A in the house and Josh Frydenberg, the Energy and Environment Minister is with us. He's answered a couple of questions about the issues of the day. Now let's talk energy, which is your portfolio. And specifically the NEG, the uh, mm. National Energy Guarantee. Last week you launched this, the National Energy Guarantee and we've had lots and lots of questions and comments from you about this. So let's get to those questions. Kay Bell says, if there's no modelling on this new policy, how do you come up with a household saving of $115 a year? And she adds, seriously, give me the maths before you dodge the question. Well, uh, the Energy Security Board, who are made up of the foremost experts in energy policy in Australia, a chair, an independent chair, Kerry Schott, and an independent deputy chair, Claire Savage, and then the three heads of the Australian Energy Market Operator, the Australian Energy Regulator, and the Australian Energy Market Commission have put in writing to the government um, their uh, advice which indicates that there will be a saving of up to $115 per annum for an average household for the period between 2020 and 2030. They base that advice on the work that has been to, done to date. Uh, AMC have looked at a whole range of schemes, obviously as a foremost body involved in this space, 
uh, and that they're very confident that by having a mechanism, which is the National Energy Guarantee, which emphasises both reliability and emissions reduction, you will get a level of investment certainty in the energy space, which will lead to more supply mm -hmm. uh, and investment, which more supply leads to lower prices. And you will also remove some of the volatility that we've seen in the market, which has led to the Australian energy market operator having to intervene and to force into the market at particular times thermal generation, uh, which has been very expensive and is the least efficient way of managing a system. So the combination of investment certainty and more reliability will send prices down. We are getting further modelling undertaken. We've said we'll make that modelling available to the states ahead of the COAG Energy Council meeting, which is going to be held in Hobart at the end of November. All right, and that modelling is specifically around how this you come up with policy. $115. Correct, or yeah. it could be a higher number. Yeah. Kay says, what will you do to guarantee the saving? Well, obviously, we can only go on the best advice to us from the experts and their understanding of the sector, what's happened in relation to other countries and other schemes, is that when you bring that investment certainty, when you remove that volatility, prices will go down. But I do want to emphasise, Sabra, we're only here talking about one component of your energy bill, which is the wholesale of the generation costs, which represent about a third. The other two thirds of your bill are the networks, which are the poles and wires, and we passed through the Parliament last week legislation to abolish the rights of those companies to game the system, which had cost consumers $6.5 billion. We've got an agreement with the retailers to provide millions of Australians with a better deal, and we're hearing all the time stories of people who go onto the Energy Made Easy website and change retailers and save hundreds of dollars, and then critically gas. We've been able to intervene into the market to see the spot price for gas come down from the highs of around $12 to around $7, which is lower prices for the public. over energy and climate policy over the last decade. And we've had so many different iterations. We've had the CPRS, we've had carbon tax, we've had ETSs, we've had EISs, we've had uh, now clean energy targets, and of course now the National Energy Guarantee. Um, but we have gone to the experts. We have sought their advice. Uh, we have produced what we think is a very balanced policy, a credible, a workable policy, which is pro-market, which is no subsidies, no taxes, no trading schemes, no carbon prices, and importantly, it has been widely endorsed. Uh, whether you speak to groups like Climate Works, I was meeting with them earlier today, uh, who operate in the emissions reduction space, and they have welcomed it. Whether it's the uh, companies that are providing wind power, they have welcomed it. Or whether indeed it's the big employers like the Blue Scopes and the BHPs who are very sensitive to energy prices. They've welcomed it. So right across the board, people recognise this is a breakthrough, as a circuit breaker, as something Sabra, which could provide this country with the long-term investment certainty in energy and climate policy. We've got some interesting questions from our viewers about some issues that haven't got a lot of um, media attention. Mm -hmm. um, one, uh, and there's... Um, uh, a question here from Joe Dave Caratha, who says, and it's a reaction to the way of pay, paying people to turn down their air conditioning, sure. for example. demand response. Yeah. I don't have air con or a pool pump. You're going to give me an energy discount. <laughs> well, uh, he will get an energy discount in a range of areas. Uh, for example, um, from the changes that we've agreed with the retailers, and obviously he'll be a beneficiary of the work that we've done with the networks and a whole range of other areas. In relation to demand response, 
Uh, people need to understand that this is not about asking them to turn down their air conditioner when it's hot. This is about using new technology to relieve the pressure on the grid at times of peak demand. And when that happens, both the consumer is better off because they have a lower power price and they can be provided for an incentive, and the retailer who sells them the energy will be better off because they won't have to purchase it at those peak prices. And we've seen it in a whole range of other countries in both Europe and North America where this has been proved effective. We have worked with ARENA, uh, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, and the Australian Energy Market Operator to run trial projects to work with businesses and households to put in place this demand response as a way of relieving the system at times of stress. There's a question that has just come in from D. Alex who says, uh, this can't change in Tasmania because Aurora's got a monopoly. Mm. Well, there are uh, obviously a, a small number of players who have a market concentration. Um, but what we have worked is... That, is that a problem? problem? It, it, it is a problem. I mentioned it in my speech uh, to the Financial Review Energy Summit just a couple of weeks ago. So, for example, uh, in 2008-09, um, the three big energy retailers... Uh, in Australia, AGL, Origin and Energy Australia had about 15% of the wholesale market. Uh, today they have nearly 50% and it's that level of concentration which doesn't produce the level of competition we need. So as a COAG Energy Council I think we do need to think about potential rule changes in the future to ensure real competition within the retail and generation space. You're watching Q&A in the House and the Minister in the hot seat answering your <laughs> questions today is Josh Reidenberg, the Energy and Environment Minister. Here's another question along the demand management line mm -hmm. from Anna Clancy. Anna, thank you very much for your question. How about incentivising low electrical usage households? I use about a quarter of the electricity, water and gas of similar sized households yet I pay the same proportion tariffs. Why not introduce a more tiered electrical tariff rate to encourage people not to be so wasteful? Yeah, well, um, this is a really interesting area and the states have a big role to play here because they're responsible, like you know, the working with the Commonwealth, to try to get a harmonious approach here. And there's been a lot of talk about what are called cost-reflective tariffs. So you, pay, uh, you should be paying the tariff based on when you're using it, not um, being subject to it, uh, just... Uh, just the whole time. So there is a lot of work that can be done in that particular area. Talking about the states, and this is not a question for viewers, but just one that's come to my head. You're gonna need all the states to get on side with the mm -hmm. National Energy Guarantee. Mm -hmm. And so far you've got a lot of noise coming from South Australia and Victoria. Um, they're sounding skeptical right now. And last week I spoke to the South Australian Premier and he said, we're not supportive. How are you going to get them on side? You've got that meeting well, that you talked about next month. I, I looked at the comments from Jay Weatherall and, you know, he's obviously scratching for a fight with the Commonwealth at every opportunity because he thinks this plays well domestically for him. I don't subscribe to that view. Um, but he is... Uh, understanding I think of the need to get the modelling to the states so that they can make an informed de decision uh, and that is what we're hoping for. We're hoping that the states would be open-minded uh, and make an informed decision uh, at the upcoming COAG meeting at the end of November on, on the National Energy Guarantee. Um, the states need to understand that a national approach to energy and in integrating climate and energy policy together is in their best interest. It's not efficient for the Australian energy market operator to be regularly intervening in the South Australian market uh, to provide thermal generation. Um, it's much more efficient to have a system as AEMO is proposing, where three years out they work out the supply of the demand balance and that um, the retailers can work out their portfolio of assets in accordance with that reliability obligation. So that is why it's in South Australia's interest. Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria's Tasmania, the ACT, they also have their own interest in signing up to the National Energy Guarantee. And I would ask them to lis listen to the chorus of opinion overwhelmingly in support of this policy, and that is why they should support it. All right. Patricia Ann via Facebook has got a question here. Why do you completely ignore the fact that major infrastructure was destroyed in the SA blackout and blame renewable energy sources for the blackout? I've made it very clear that what happened in South Australia... Uh, uh, was that the system was left very vulnerable 
um, to problems by a high reliance on intermittent sources of power without the necessary storage and backup. This meant that more power was coming in from the interconnector um, and this meant that uh, if the wind didn't blow there wasn't going to be that level of supply that is needed. Now South Australia made those mistakes, the system became more vulnerable. As for the South Australian particular case, I've always said that that was instigated by a, a, uh, a storm, but what happened was that the system was highly vulnerable uh, to what had happened because it had not put in place the backup and the storage and the systems it needed. Okay, here's a question from Donald Young from Footscray, who's taken an interest in matters New South Wales by the look of it. Should ICAC investigate how the New South Wales government sold a power station for a million dollars <laughs> only to have it valued at $750 million less than two years later? Look, they're not, they're not, they're not issues for, for me to opine on. They're ones that you, you can direct to the relevant authorities. You don't want to buy into that one at I all? I don't want to buy into that one. It's not a good look. I mean, that is not a good look on the face value. Um, Anthony Lonergan uh, has got a question here about our Paris commitments. Mm. Australia's got a Paris commitment for 26 to 28 percent reduction on the 2005 emissions. Mm -hmm. Electricity accounts for one third of our mm -hmm. emissions. Electricity production is only one sector of the, eco the economy mm -hmm. and has alternatives capable of driving deeper cuts apart from land clearing. If if cuts to emissions from the electricity sector are limited to 26 to 28%, then other sectors like transport, agriculture, LNG, steel, cement making, etc., will have to make similar cuts. What are your policies to drive significant emissions reductions from these sources? Well, you're right. You need a whole of economy approach to meet that goal of a 26 to 28% uh, reduction on 2005 levels by 2030. Uh, Dr Finkel makes it very clear in the electricity sector that by taking more than 26 to 28 percent of emissions out by 2030 you will risk reliability and affordability. We have to be very careful. Uh, as for the other sectors we have an emissions reduction fund which has been able to achieve about 189 million tonnes of abatement at a cost of under 12 dollars a tonne in the land sector. When it comes to um, the built environment uh, we have a National Energy Productivity Plan which is aiming to boost efficiency by 40% by 2030 and we will release new building standards all the time uh, as well as new standards for appliances and the like. Uh, the work that we are doing with the industrial sector and trying to boost efficiency there are important and of course in the renewable energy target we've seen a five-fold increase in renewables in 2016 compared to 2015 and some $8 billion worth of investment in renewables underway right now, equivalent to about 4,000 megawatts of power. So we are seeing a transition to a lower emissions future. We are seeing action in a whole range of fronts. All right. Let's finish on an international affairs question. Andrea, friend of Yapoon in Queensland. Thank you, Andrea, for your question. What do you think about the reality of Kim Jong-un's threat towards the US and President Trump's verbal retaliation? Is this just a war of words or is nuclear war a future reality? Well, I certainly would hope not, and I know that wise heads will prevail. Uh, obviously, we are, uh, as a country in, in Australia, uh, very focused on these issues, and I leave that to the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister. And sorry for me smiling through all of that. We've had an, air, we've had an energy problem here. One of our lights <laughs> is blown. Last a little question. bit ironic. But thank you very much. You've been watching Q&A in the House. I'm Sabra Lane. Our special guest today has been Josh Frydenberg, the Energy and Environment Minister. Thanks for your time. Lovely to be with you. Thank you for your questions and thank you for watching. I wonder how many people watch that. I bet you a lot. I don't know. More will watch the replay. And I didn't get Peter's last question in. Not last question, last point. I'm sacked. I couldn't... I couldn't.